beloved. Today's episode is titled, NASA Hires Priest to Prepare Humanity for Contact with Aliens. Now, NASA, uh, everybody knows what NASA is. They explore space. However, they are publicly funded by the government. So these are your taxpayer dollars at work. I know you'll be super excited to hear that. <laughs> They've hired not only one priest, uh, he's from England, uh, but a team of priests, a team of theologians to prepare humanity for contact with aliens and even see how the world religions would react. And what they want to know is how would the world's major religions respond if we were to encounter alien life? Um, the reason this is tied in, this is a picture right here of the James Webb Space Telescope. This is the largest telescope we've ever shot into space. It was just uh, shot into space uh, on Christmas, uh, Christmas morning. It actually looks really cool. You can find things like that online. And there's a lot of talk. I've heard this on Fox News, Christian websites, non-Christian websites, brothers in the faith. A lot of people seem to be talking about aliens. Well, what if we find aliens? And it's really easy to sort of unmask this. A lot of false teachers are saying, well, if we found aliens, we'd have to rewrite the Bible. And I'm going to bring up some articles and, and things like that to explain it in a minute. Um, that's essentially, uh, you know, what's going on. And I've talked to some brothers in the faith where they're, they're like worried, like, what if we do find aliens and I'm wrong about everything, right? And so I wanted to start with this Bible verse and a statement. I'll start here on the bottom. Um, it's not wrong to have questions about the universe, questions in general, right? Doubts. God can work through that to confirm the truth, right? But a proper biblical understanding is where you should start. Okay, I love Hebrews 11.3. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of the things which are visible. Several times during evangelism, I've explained this to people and I've seen a light go on in their head. I was talking to a young lady recently. She would like pray to the universe a lot, right? And like pray to, you know, uh, planets, whatever it was. And I had to explain to her that God, he's not just up, right? In, in theory, you know, yes, I get it. We look up to God. We look up to the heavens, right? Right. But God, he's not just up. He's completely outside creation. He's outside the universe. He's outside the galaxies. He was from eternity. When there was no universe, no creation, nothing, he simply is the I am. So God is outside creation. Jesus Christ is God in human flesh. It's how he enters his own creation, time and space, right? So with that being said, you have to understand, even if tomorrow we found aliens, uh, they would just be another creature we didn't know about. They wouldn't rock my, my faith at all. I, I wouldn't, you know, all of a sudden be questioning all these great truths of the Bible. Um, but that being said, let me explain what I think is really happening here, okay? Uh, Paul warns us in Timothy that a time is coming, people will turn their ears away from truth and be turned aside to fables. That Greek word means myths, silliness, nonsense. You see, the scriptures are fully sufficient for a true believer. That means we're complete. We don't need anything but the scriptures. If we needed to know about aliens, God would have told us about them. He would have warned us about them. He would have told us about them. Um, if it's not in there, you, you don't technically need it. And so I'm going to bring up this article having said that. Um, uh, this is just from the Times. It says, Heavens Above, NASA Enlist Priests to Prepare for an Alien uh, Discovery. And so basically they want to know how the discovery of extraterrestrials would change the way we see the universe, right? Um, and, and I just highlighted a few things. The Reverend Dr. Andrew Davison, he's a priest and theologian at the University of Cambridge with a doctorate in biochemistry from Oxford, okay? So he's obviously a genius. He's among 24 theologians who have taken part in a NASA-sponsored program at the Center for Theological Inquiry at Princeton in the United States to assess, and this is highlighted, how the world's major religions would react to news that life exists on, world be, uh, on worlds beyond our own. Now, I'm going to bring up other parts of this article soon. It's very clear that this is all done in an effort to challenge the authority 
of the scriptures, to challenge the authority of the God of Abraham, right? And so I'll bring that up here in a second, but I wanted to bring up some Bible verses and show a couple other things related to aliens in the pseudo-religious realm, just to give us a, a base here. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4 in the Bible is just replete with warnings about this type of behavior. It says, Take heed, lest you lift your eyes to the heavens, and when you see the sun, the moon, and the stars, and all the hosts of heaven, the planets, anything in the heavens, the galaxy, you feel driven to worship them and serve them, okay? And there's many, many, many other warnings. Jeremiah warned about it. False gods are typically based on the sun, the moon, and the stars. Now, I know they're not bowing down and worshiping it, but as I bring up the articles, I want you to see they're trying to create a false beliefs, false religion, okay? They're turning aside to these myths. Um, Pope Francis made the headline a couple years ago. He said he would baptize Martians if they asked, even aliens from faraway planets. Who are we to, to close the doors? Now, he had another sort of secular humanistic reason for saying that. Um, but the Catholic Church, just so everybody knows, I find this extremely interesting, uh, they have a massive observatory. They have one of the largest telescopes on Earth. The Pope has an astronomer. Um, his name is hard to pronounce. I, I won't butcher it. <laughs> they believe that their faith inspires their science. However, since it seems to be very dedicated to things, uh, the Catholic faith seems to be inspired by climate change. It's inspired by um, even the theologian, Dr. Robert Davidson, or Andrew Davison, who's going, you know, on this program, you know, hired by NASA, um, he even wrote a book saying how the church needs to welcome the LGBTQ community, and I'm sure he has a bunch of science in there related to evolution of this is just how God made us. Um, but you're seeing a great merging of faith and science, and, and I'm not talking about hard sciences like engineering and math or even biology that shows the glory of God in creation. A lot of pseudoscience mixed with a lot of pseudo-religion. And so I wanted to bring up this Bible verse uh, from Genesis 11. And I know it might sound strange. Why are you going back to the Tower of Babel? So much can be understood about biblical prophecy going back to the Tower of Babel. I recommend you guys watch my Mystery Babylon video. But if you go all the way back to the Tower of Babel, we all had one language, okay? And we started to build a tower to the heavens, okay, to make a name for ourselves, to make humanity great, and to challenge God. And God came down. He said, the people are one. They all have one language. This is what they begin to do. Now nothing they propose to do will be withheld from them. And so he came down and judged us, and we, he confused our language. Well, over the last 20 years, specifically with iPhones, smartphones, we have essentially changed that back. And I listened to Paul Washer say this the other day. I've heard MacArthur say it. I've heard a lot of, of uh, good pastors say this. Uh, and, and I believe this myself, too. The number one reason I believe judgment is coming is because the world, once again, is speaking again, and we're getting, uh, we're sort of multiplying the evil. If you have a false teaching in Brazil, it's heard in Australia that afternoon, right? And so mankind corrupts itself. And as it, 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 as it can, we can all speak together now, I mean, 10 billion mobile devices are in use today, uh, and they can easily, through Google Translate, just translate language. As we can all speak together, we just start to wander off into myths and we begin to corrupt ourselves again. I'm going to talk more about that later. Um, Second Timothy warns that in the last days, people will have a form of godliness, but deny its power and from such people turn away. Now, these people are claiming to be theologians um, and it's not, you know, you can't put on a suit and tie and I, I put a statement here. There's not even a thought or concern about demonic activity. Guys, I, I, just by reading the Bible, just, just from Genesis to Revelation, if tomorrow they say, oh, we found an alien or some sort of being came from outer space, specifically if it challenged anything God said in his word, uh, the first place you should go if you're just a faithful student of the word is demonic activity. doesn't mean that it's what it is, but that's just where your brain would go if you had a form of godliness but did not deny its power, right? Because that's what the Bible sort of warns about, right? Paul said, even if an angel comes down from heaven preaching another gospel, let him be, you know, accursed. And so you see a lot of this form of godliness, this theological astuteness, you could say, 
um, but it, it's, it's without any sort of power, okay? And Ephesians chapter 6 says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, okay? All throughout the Bible, the galaxies, the planets are seen as sort of the host of some of the, these fallen angels that corrupt mankind. For example, in Isaiah 24, it's talking about the day of the Lord, the day of judgment, when the, the second coming of Christ. Uh, it says he'll punish the host of heaven in heaven and the kings of the earth on the earth. They're going to be gathered together as prisoners in a pit. They'll be shut up in a prison and after many days will be punished. That ties in perfectly with Revelation 20. During the thousand-year millennial kingdom of Christ, right before it, Satan is thrown uh, into the pit, okay? And he's bound for a thousand years. And when the thousand years are ended, he's released from his prison and he is punished, most likely with his other, you know, demonic angels, okay? Jesus warned about false signs, deceptions, wonders towards the end. Paul warned about them as well. And that deception will get to such a height, such a fever pitch, even true believers could be deceived. And so I want to go through, I'm going to bring up more of this article in a minute. It's really fascinating how they're challenging uh, the word of God, but, and several other things are really fascinating. And I'll get to it. I want to give you just one example or a few small examples of how the Bible warns about coming demonic activity, how it explains, you know, what it is, right? And so here's Revelation 9. It's just replete with all sorts of different things. And then I'm going to bring up uh, Jesus's words in Luke to bring it to light a little bit. In Revelation 9, locusts come upon the earth from a great uh, furnace. Basically, a star falls from heaven, uh, and there's a key given to him to the bottomless pit. So this fallen star is a, is a fallen angel. Okay, He opens up a pit on earth, smoke rises out of it, locusts come upon the earth, and they have power like scorpions. They can sting you, but they're commanded not to harm the grass or any green thing, but just people who, who aren't, don't have the seal of God, ju just non-believers. Um, they're not given authority to kill, but to torment people for five months. When you hear about these scorpions going down here into the second, uh, second paragraph, they have faces like faces of men. They have women's hair. They have teeth like lion's teeth. They have tails like scorpions. They even have a king uh, over them. And his name in Hebrew is Abaddon and in Greek and is Apollyon. It means the destroyer. Okay. And so these are clearly demonic creatures. And, and at the time of the end, it's going to be a fascinating, miraculous, terrifying time. But these are demonic creatures. Um, the sixth trumpet then blows. This is deep into the tribulation. Four angels who had been prepared for the hour, day, and month, and year were released, right? Good angels are not bound or released, so these are probably fallen angels. They kill a third of mankind, and they have a 200 million army. Whether you believe that's people or fallen angels, that's where I tend to go. A third of mankind is killed, but then right after that, you get a very clear warning. The rest of the mankind uh, that were not killed by these horrible plagues, the scorpions, the 200 million person army... They would not repent. And one of the first things it says they won't repent from is their worship of demons. So Revelation makes it very clear the time is going to come. And, and I believe the times here a lot with sorcery, the occult, drugs, uh, various false religions. People do worship demons without even knowing right now. That being said, I think that's going to keep rising and rising as we get towards the time of the end, whenever that is. And now that you understand what, you know, those demonic scorpion like locust in the end it really brings to light luke 10 check this out 70 returned jesus sent them out to preach the gospel with joy saying lord even the demons are subject to us in your name but he said to them i saw satan fall like lightning from heaven behold i give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy he's not talking about just physical serpents and scorpions he's talking about demonic entities watch i'll prove it in a second he says, nothing by any means shall hurt you. He goes on to say, don't rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you. So that's what he's saying. These scorpions, these snakes, he's giving them an example that there, there is a realm we don't understand, a demonic realm we don't understand, an angelic realm we don't understand. But if you're a true believer in Christ, the spirits are subject to you. Not that you can go out and command them or start acting crazy. It's just that God will not let a hair of your head you know, fall. 
But then he says, rejoice because your names are, are written in heaven, right? And this is why I think Paul said in Galatians, if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we've preached to you, let him be accursed. You see, there is a time coming where your people are going to see miraculous signs. There's going to be all sorts of deception. Who knows? Maybe aliens will be a part of it, right? I mean, it really just blows my mind. Mankind is always just turning aside to myths, creating, you know, you're literally watching the creation of a potential false religion, right? And that's, that's I'm going to bring that up a little bit later, but that's what we're watching in sort of slow motion. And so I want to bring up a few verses and then more of this article, really shocking parts of this article. This is all about, though, uh, just these two statements. This is about hating God. That's how the Bible describes mankind. It's, it's in a state of enmity, hostility towards God. We've joined the rebellion of Satan, so it's hating God. I know it's not outright. It's under deception, right, and creating false religion. Atheism and false Christianity are just a stepping stone to false religions and gods. Listen, so many people would not be worked up over aliens and, and it questioning their faith if we haven't taught an entire generation for decades now uh, the, the complete lie of evolution, that nothing blew up and created everything, right? That being said, let me just read this really quick, talking about worshiping the hosts in heaven and, and looking towards the sky. And I know NASA doesn't think they're doing this, but I'm going to get to it in a second. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything, in heaven above or on the earth beneath in the waters below. Don't bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of, this is key, those who hate me. God separates mankind into sheep and goats, good fish, bad fish, wheat, tares. There's not a third category. There are those who love God. There are those who hate God. Romans chapter 1 says, when we reject God, and I know this is hard to understand, but as you read the word of God, it becomes clear. I'm not saying people are all out there just outrightly rejecting God and screaming at him That's or, or saying they hate them. It's that they make a God in their own image. That God is very comfortable with their sin or their ideologies. It's not an authoritative God. It's not the true God. So the Bible says they become God haters because if they knew the true God, they would reject him. Insolent, arrogant, and boastful, they, and this is key, they invent ways of doing evil. They invent ways of doing evil. So I'm going to bring up part of the article now I'm most excited to show you guys. It's the most interesting part of the article and break it down. But you're watching people invent ways of doing evil. That's, that's all we're doing. So this is in the article. Davidson, uh, probably the leader of these 24 theologians, seeks to answer theological questions, such as whether or not God made life in other parts of the universe. All right, not bad so far. That's, you know, no big deal. Or if he sent a savior to die for the sins of aliens. Guys, what a joke to even, I mean, that's fine to ask yourself in your mind, but to say I'm partnering with NASA when the Bible warns light should have no work being done with darkness. I want to see if there's another savior to die for the sins of aliens. You don't even know if they exist. You're curious if there's a savior. And listen, guys, Jesus is the only savior. He's the only way. So that to me is just absolute silliness. And, and I would probably not even make this video if it weren't for the next thing I read. It's another question the British priest seeks to tackle is if discovering extraterrestrial life demands religions to rewrite the entire story of creation in Genesis, what an arrogant, proud, bold-faced rejection of the word of God. This is a man, unfortunately, who's deceived himself. He's in a state of hating God. He's rejecting the word of God and looking for a new savior because he doesn't like the savior of the Bible. He's looking for a new creation story because he doesn't want the one in creation. This goes all the way back to the garden. Did God really say? Davidson wrote a book that the world's major religions would take the news of an alien discovery in their stride. Guys, I want you to see this parallel here because... If you just look at the world and the news, and I would pause it and read these, and I'll go through them in a second. If you look at the world through the lens of the Bible, things start to make sense. The Bible says, in your light, we see light. We see reality. Look at this parallel. Start in the bottom left with this little dark picture here. Uh, it's just a, an example of the devil. It's probably not what he looks like at all, right? But look at the words of the devil in Isaiah 14. He says in his heart, 
I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And this was Satan's rebellion. This is why Jesus saw Satan fall. He was cast out of heaven because pride was found in him. He corrupted himself. Then he comes down to earth and he, he corrupts us. We join that same rebellion, guys. That's, that's what we're waiting, you know, that's what Jesus was fixing on the cross, reconciling the world back to him. We, we sinned in the garden, we fell, we joined the rebellion. Our father became the devil. Now look at the Tower of Babel. Th these are verses from the Bible. Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens, whose top is in the heavens. Remember, I will ascend into heaven down here, right? Let us make a name for ourselves, for ourselves, self-righteousness. The Lord said, indeed, the people are one. They all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing they propose to do will be withheld from them. They'll do more and more evil things. It'll just get insane. But now, look, here we are thousands and thousands of year, years later. Now that we can all speak and work together again, come, come. Let us blast off into space to rewrite the word of God and reject the God of the Bible to find new gods, to see how religions would respond to these alien figures, to rewrite the word of God. What a joke. Come, let's do this. Grab 24 theologians so we look legit. This is how we should view the world. You know, we, we want to have nothing but mercy and grace for these people. We want to preach the gospel to these people. Um, but in order to do that, you, you've got to call them out in what they're doing. You, you, I mean, we are sinners. We need grace. We need mercy. We don't want a form of godliness. We want to make uh, without power, right? We want the God with power. And, and Paul said, we preach the gospel, not in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. And so why, why is this happening? Why, why is this happening? I want to bring up some other articles that are related to space, but kind of separate. But this is why this is happening, guys. This is, this is really why. Jeremiah 2, Jeremiah is talking to Israel. You can certainly apply this specifically to the West, but just to any people, group, or person that forsakes God. Um, God says, be astonished, O heavens, at this. Be terrified. Be horribly afraid, says the Lord. My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the true God, the fountain of living waters. They've hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. That's false religion, false ideology, false goals in life to give our life meaning. There is no wisdom against the Lord, the Bible says. There's no knowledge in opposition to him. There's no purpose in life outside of him that's worth anything. And so uh, here's a couple things. I want to talk about Elon Musk very quickly, his SpaceX Starship. And this concept he created, I've heard people talk about this and, you know, I'm just using this as an example, but this light of consciousness that, that Elon Musk, I want to show you the example of a, a, a well that we've dug that's kind of silly. Elon Musk believes, uh, he doesn't believe in God, uh, that we need to travel multi-planetary, we need to expand the human race to protect the light of consciousness. That means humans right now, there's no aliens, we're the only intelligent life forms in the creation. And if, for example, we have a nuclear war or climate change, if it ends, the light of consciousness goes out. So his goal, what he's deceived himself into basically saying is he's going to save humanity, right? He, and he says, I'm not trying to be a savior, but this is the idea he worked up. Many, many people have gotten behind it. There's many things you can see. People call him our savior. Uh, and, and there's many, many articles written about this that by him, uh, launching to, to, to other planets with Starship, all sorts. And Elon Musk has done some amazing things in, in the private sector. But by him doing that, he's literally, you can see this article, he's going to save humanity from what he sees as a looming extinction, right? Uh, this is just a simple article. There's thousands like it that he's the savior humanity needs. And so when we reject the God of the Bible, you see, we turn aside to just, even if you don't know it's a God in your head, it could just be an idol, a person that you look up to. It could be Kim Kardashian. It could be Elon Musk. It doesn't matter. But listen to the words of God. It says in Isaiah, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. 700 years later, Christ stands up on the last day of the feast. He says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me. Let him drink. 
He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Guys, Jesus is God. He is the fountain of life, okay? I mean, it is overwhelming the truths behind him, and we, can, we need to make sure we do not reject him. And so what should we do? Uh, question mark. And I think the Bible is really clear on this. We need wisdom, okay? It's written, uh, God, God wrote to the Corinthians. That's why this is called Foolish Ministries. He says, I'll destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. He's not talking about biblical wisdom, godly wisdom. One of God's missions is to destroy the wisdom of the world. I mean, look at the wisdom of the world. We're going to hire a priest and 24 theologians, brilliant men, who claim you know they understand the Bible, and we're going to blast off into space and see if we can rewrite the Bible. These men have probably studied the Bible more than, any, more than me or anyone listening to this podcast. They're, they're, they're theologians, and yet they don't get that the Bible is the Word of God. They don't get that it's authoritative. They, they don't understand that God says, my word is settled in the heavens. It, it cannot be altered or changed. They, they, they've missed that. They've rejected it. Um, I always say Satan's the best theologian. He knows the Bible. He knows how to take it literally. He knows who Jesus is. He just rejects him. So God is going to destroy this wisdom of the world. Jose talks about wisdom. He says, who is wise? Let him understand these things. Who is prudent? Let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. If you are not born again, you cannot walk the narrow road. You cannot go into the sheep pen another way. You must be born again. The righteous walk in them. Speaking about wisdom, Daniel chapter 12 is specifically talking about the time of the end. It says many will be purified. They'll be made white and refined in the blood of the lamb is what he's talking about. But I would encourage you, if you're a lukewarm believer, if you're a believer who's maybe elevating knowledge above just the study of scripture and your relationship with Jesus, and just kind of elevating that Gnostic knowledge, um, purify yourself, make yourself white, get to the Lord and, and ask him to reveal wisdom for you. He says, the wicked will do wickedly and none of the wicked will understand, but the wise will understand. This is what I'm trying to say. And as we're preaching the gospel, we can have mercy towards these people. The wicked don't understand. They don't understand what they're doing. They don't get what they're doing is an absolute loot, you know, blasting off into space, looking for aliens, having theologians who people probably trust to interpret the word of God say, we're going to rewrite the Genesis creation story. We're going to do that. Um, that's an abomination to God. And so here's some wisdom. I think it's really, you know, just some verses I'm bringing up and just really a way to look at this. Okay, on the left is then, a thousand years ago. On the right is now. Then in Amos chapter five, uh, God condemns Israel. He says, you, you took up Sikath, your King Kiun, your star God, your star gods, your images of the stars that you made for yourselves and worshiped. That was 2,700 years ago. Guys, we have the queen of heaven, the goddess of the moon, the sun god, Ra and Tammuz, Baal, Ashtoreth. I mean, look at every mosque in the world, guys. It's got a moon on it, right? A little half crescent moon. That's because before they made up the false religion of Islam, they used to worship the moon. Okay, that was then. We looked up to the stars and we created false religion. Well, look now. Hey, maybe there's an alien savior. Perhaps we can find aliens to disprove the word of God in Genesis. This is 2021. Solomon said, what has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. You cannot find anything new. Mankind has not gotten any wiser. Now we've gotten smarter. We've got more knowledge. We've got iPhones. We've not gotten any wiser. We've not grown in morality at all. We have gotten worse and worse, just like the Bible says. So we're in need of great wisdom. How do we go and get it? And just some very, very practical steps I want to share with you in closing. In Daniel chapter 10, just these three words, the Bible, the word of God is called the scripture of truth, the scripture of truth. An angel calls it that. John chapter 10, Jesus says the scripture cannot be broken. Jesus Christ himself, if you're a theologian, you should understand. Jesus said the scripture can't be broken. Jesus himself said, I didn't come to destroy the law or the prophets, uh, but to fulfill them. Jesus was manifested and part of that was to fulfill scripture down to the T. I mean, it was amazing. Uh, Paul writes to Timothy, he says, from childhood, you've known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise. The scriptures make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Guys, 
the natural revelation from God is in creation. You can learn about God by looking up at the stars. Sure, look at the vast power of the sun, but that's not God. That's just his creation. If you want to meet the Lord Jesus Christ, you have to go to scripture and you have to take the God of scripture. You can't make your own God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, and correction, for instruction in righteousness, that, and this is key, the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. You don't need anything. Now, I think you should have a basic understanding if you're evangelizing to Catholics or if you're evangelizing to someone who believes in evolution or somebody who's, you know, frustrated or thinking about aliens a lot. You can have a basic understanding but 98% of your life and your study should be devoted to these scriptures and to just learning about Jesus. The whole point of this YouTube channel, teaching ministries, the church, everything is to build up believers in the knowledge of who Jesus really is. That, this is key, we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. That's what evolution is. It, it tosses true believers to and fro. That's what this alien nonsense is. I've seen believers talk to me and say, this gets me worried. What if we found an alien tomorrow? I would question my faith. I've seen this. This is trickery of men who reject God. And so I want to encourage you. I'm just bringing up my YouTube channel really quick. Learn the prophecies of the Bible, the overwhelming truth. Start on the bottom here in the Old Testament prophecies of Jesus Christ learn that Jesus is the only expected person in human history. Hundreds of things were written about Christ before he was born. He was, you know, the tribe of Judah, the line of David, where he would be born in Bethlehem 700 years before he was born, that he would be killed for the sin of others. I mean, he's truly the promised Messiah. Go look at some end times Bible prophecy, eschatology. The Bible has overwhelmingly predicted the future again and again and again and again. I mean, God even calls himself God in Isaiah, and he says, because I'm the God who tells the end from the beginning. Now, I don't know when the end is, but you can certainly say, see that the world is trending towards that. And so my encouragement is get into the word of God, learn the truth from there, and then you'll be able to just discern when somebody is just bold-faced speaking against the word of God. Proverbs 26 says, don't answer a fool according to his folly, because then you'll be like him. Okay, as true believers, we have to combat lies and error with the truth. Okay, not vain babbling, useless arguments. Only a population that has been taught the baseless nonsense of evolution, that nothing blew up and created everything, would be susceptible to these types of deceptions. It's the same with climate change, right? We're, we're not really going to destroy the planet. The Bible says God's going to destroy the planet one day. Okay, when you don't have a sovereign God, when you don't have a God, you worry about all this other nonsense. Okay, uh, just in closing, John chapter eight says, "He who, he who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you don't hear because you're not of God." Now, I think apologetics is good, but you have to understand we can elevate knowledge, just knowledge and debates and arguments above wisdom. Listen, not everyone's going to believe you. That's okay. The Bible says that. First John says, we're of God. He who knows God hears us. He who's not of God does not hear us. By this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. John 14, Jesus says, the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, the world cannot receive. It doesn't see him or know him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. 1 Corinthians says, The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Here's the most important foolishness he cannot understand. Okay, 1 Corinthians 1.18, God says, The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Do not be ashamed of it. It says, in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. That's my encouragement to you. When you preach the gospel, God knows it sounds foolish to the world. It is pleasing to him. Now, you don't want to just sound silly, start condemning people, or talking funny. What I'm saying is speak in a spiritual manner, okay? These people, you can appeal to their intellect a bit. Explain to them, listen, the Bible's sufficient. What if you have a form of godliness without power? What if you believe in evolution, that nothing exploded, created everything? 
but then appeal to their conscience that we're sinners, that we need a savior, that Christ has been crucified. It's through that foolishness of showing what his son has truly done that I've seen God convert sinners, okay? Not in the wisdom of man, in the power of God, okay? But the, the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. We need wisdom. Jesus became to us wisdom from God. And so that's my encouragement. If you're a believer, get in the word, put that first, pursue, you know, Solomon said, here is wisdom, get wisdom, pursue the true wisdom of the Holy Bible. Okay. That God wants you pursue the true wisdom and the knowledge of Jesus. Um, doesn't mean, you know, Solomon said, don't be without knowledge. It's not good for us not to be with knowledge, but make that first. If you're a non-believer here, here's what I'm begging you. The Bible is fully sufficient. Okay. Jesus Christ died for sinners. Repent, turn from all this nonsense, turn from these empty wells and turn back to the fountain, the fountain of living waters. Jesus said, anyone who thirsts, come to me and drink. No matter what you've done, Christ will forgive you. He'll wash you from your sins. So just repent, turn from them, trust in Jesus.